Okay, so this is the fourth or I guess technically fifth video I'm talking about Prehistoric Planet. I mean, I've talked about Prehistoric Planet just about every video on this channel, but like the video's mainly focusing on it. But this is going over the fourth episode. I believe it's Ice Worlds. It's just, I know it's the episode with the snow and ice, and I'm pretty sure it's titled Ice Worlds, but let's just get right into it. Uh, it's really cool right off the bat seeing dinosaurs in the snow. It's so cool, uh, literally. <laughs> But, uh, considering birds can do fine in the snow, I think it makes perfect sense dinosaurs could survive in the snow and do completely fine. Uh, because, you know, most of the time when you think of dinosaurs, you aren't really thinking of snow, but I think it makes perfect sense that dinosaurs would be able to live in the snow. Um, uh, and I'm starting to notice one thing, though, that I'm not crazy about, though, with this documentary. They are very vague with some of the dinosaurs. The first dromaeosaur, they just call it a dromaeosaur. So whenever they do that, I just assumed it was Dromaeosaurus itself, but you know, maybe it's not. Uh, but yeah, like it could be a different Dromaeosaur. And this is not the first time they did this. Uh, like the last episode, they just called the Plesiosaur and Elasmosaur, which makes me also think it's just Elasmosaurus, but um, you know, I'm not for sure. Uh, but it is cool seeing the Dromaeosaur similar to an animal like a coyote, where they eat small animals like bugs and small mammals. Uh, but then whenever they, you know, group up, they can take down larger prey. In the Dromaeosaurus case, the baby Edmontosaurs, or the baby Hadrosaurs, I should say. Uh, and in like a coyote's case, deer. Uh, and once again, though, like I was saying, though, being very vague, saying Hadrosaur instead of just Hadrosaurus or Edmontosaurus. Uh, but whenever they do that, I'm pretty much just going to assume they mean Hadrosaurus. Whatever the actual dinosaur is that you pretty much just add us to. But, you know, I know you can't always do that. But I don't like that they're super vague with it. And I understand, like, in some situations, like, if there's fossil evidence of a dinosaur, like, say there's evidence of a dromaeosaur in that area, but they don't know specifically which dromaeosaur there is, like, they just have footprint marks or something, then I guess it makes sense. But they just do it so much that you know that they don't have to do that every time. Um, but... That's my, one of my only gripes with it, but I am kind of being nitpicky because the documentary is just so great. Uh, but the river crossing scene is very similar to what, you know, you see with like wildebeest crossing the river in Africa, but instead of like fearing of crocodiles, they fear more um, just the actual ice and the water itself. Because, you know, the babies for sure could easily get lost in the current, and even the adults could. Uh, I do like how they showed the dromaeosaurs were kind of successful, because like modern day hunters, they do not always succeed and usually do not end up making a kill the majority of the time. But they were successful because the river provided a meal, but their causing a panic in the herd probably contributed to getting that meal because if the hadrosaurs just were just going across the river with no cause of panic, they might have all made it, but maybe they wanted that anyways. So maybe the dromaeosaurs did actually contribute to the kill, but you know, they didn't actually kill one. But that's you know, similar to a lot of modern day hunters, so I kind of like that. Um, I like they included the Ornithomimus. I think I've mentioned this about, like, in the last episode with Dinochirus. Um, I really like the herbivorous or omnivorous theropods. They're just such cool and weird dinosaurs that I just enjoy them so much. Uh, I really enjoyed watching the Ornithomimus scene due to how the Ornithomimus acted. It was pretty funny watching it steal from the other ornithomimus nest and then when it got caught and like fell over. And also it was funny watching it try to scare off the hadrosaur because you know if that hadrosaur really wanted the ornithomimus' items in its nest, it could easily take it up because what would the ornithomimus do if the hadrosaur actually was trying to get to its nest? Nothing. Um, so that was kind of funny. Uh, I am glad that they actually called the hadrosaur, this different hadrosaur, a Laura Titan, uh, instead of just saying it was a hadrosaur with a crest or something. But you know, it could have been like Cynthosaurus or Lambiosaurus. I know it didn't look like a Lambiosaur crest, but I'm just saying as an example. Uh, so I'm really glad that they just called it a Laura Titan. Uh, I am really enjoying the hadrosaurs in this documentary, though. Um, from every episode, I. T-Rex, I think, is the only actual dinosaur in the first episode, you know, thinking about it now. But in the second episode, you know, we get some hadrosaurs. In the third episode, we got some hadrosaurs, I believe. What was the third episode? Well, I'm already forgetting what. I think there was hadrosaurs in the third episode. I know there was some in the second episode because there was the ones in the desert. 
and the other ones in the desert, like around the Tarvasaur. But I know they were for sure in the second episode, and I know they were in the fourth episode, but I'm really enjoying the Hadrosaurus uh, in the documentary. Though I believe it, I think it is the best portrayal of Hadrosaurus in a documentary yet. There's almost a stigma with Hadrosaurus, though, that they are like the boring herbivores, and usually when portrayed in dino, dino media, they're usually just prey for some theropod. But I've really enjoyed the hadrosaurs in the documentary, and I think that this is showing that they aren't just the boring herbivores that you think of getting eaten by theropods, but they're actually really cool dinosaurs on their own, which I really like. And they didn't even do like the most popular one. Like I think most people think the coolest um, hadrosaurs probably Parasaurolophus or Parasaurolophus. Uh, but I'm, it might have been extinct by now, actually. But and it might be in the last episode. But it's I've really enjoyed the hadrosaurs that they've used. But I do wish they would have actually said the species name for some. But that's all I can really knock on the hadrosaurs in this documentary. Um, one thing though on the Lord Titan that I really liked, but almost all of the baby dinosaurs in this documentary did was they didn't do like cookie cutter copies for the babies. Like a bunch of times in Dino Media, you'll see the baby dinosaurs are literally the exact copy of the big dinosaur, but just smaller. They made them look a lot different, you know. They didn't have the crest, uh, and they just looked like chunkier, I guess is the term I would use. Uh, and like also with the T-Rex, obviously, they were way thinner and feathered. I like that because, you know, most animals today are not cookie cutter copies of their parents. Some are, but not all. So I'm glad that they didn't do that for all the baby dinosaurs. Um, also on the Baby Allura Titan. I love how they showed that the parents acting as great parents because, you know, we have evidence that Hadrosaurs were some of the better parent dinosaurs. Uh, so I like that they represented it really well. And this is kind of a little personal thing, but personally, I would consider myself an animal lover. And there are not many animals that I, I would even say I dislike, but mosquitoes. I personally hate mosquitoes. So for me personally, this was the saddest baby death in the series yet. Like, I really liked the baby T-Rexes and it was kind of sad seeing the one get eaten by the Mosasaur, but I wasn't super sad because I like Mosasaur and you know, it's kind of just the way of life, but seeing a dinosaur I really liked and it being a baby one die to mosquitoes was very sad because you could just see it in like the parent's face that it didn't want to leave it, but it knew for like the, for the rest of its babies it needed to go on and for itself, but it just had to leave the one. And that might have been the one that ended up making it back on the hill, but there was a few that definitely died uh, to the mosquitoes, which was super sad. Because, you know, I'm fine with the dinosaurs dying to other dinosaurs or other cool prehistoric reptiles and stuff, but to mosquitoes, no. Don't have dinosaurs die to mosquitoes, please. I mean, I know it definitely happened, but it's still, that's probably my least favorite dinosaur death in a documentary ever. Uh... So now that I'm on my little mosquito rant is done, um, the unnamed Troodontid. I know there's some controversy recently with Troodon, but I'm not 100% sure on exactly what it was, but Troodontids were very smart dinosaurs. You know, they were closely related to Dromaeosaurs. They might actually be a group in Dromaeosaurs, but uh, they were some of the smartest dinosaurs. Uh, and it makes sense that they would be smart enough to know to catch prey that were fleeing from fires, but... <laughs> Picking up the stick that had the sparks on it, I honestly think that might be a little too speculative. And I kind of went over it, this documentary almost being a little too speculative already. Like, I'm glad that they went speculative, though, because I'm glad they didn't just do the boring tropes that everybody thinks is pretty much 100% accurate. But, like, the cleaning itself, the T-Rex cleaning itself off with the wound to decrease the chance of infection, that was kind of... But this, picking up fire... I don't know. That seems kind of... I mean, Trudons are supposed to be really smart dinosaurs. Or Trudontids are supposed to be really smart dinosaurs. So, if any dinosaur could do it, it would be a Trudontid. But still. You know, most animals just have the instinct to flee fire. So, that was kind of yeah, a little, little speculative for my liking. But, I understand why they did it with a Trudontid. If they did it with any other dinosaur, you would have really questioned it. But, I guess they kind of get off with it with it being such a smart dinosaur. Um... Uh, Um, and then the three young Antarctic Pelta. I love them. They were such cute little dinosaurs. Um, and I love how they showed them using caves. Um, uh, you don't really see many dinosaurs in, like, paleo art or in, like, documentaries in caves. But, you know, so many modern-day animals, especially, like, smaller animals, 
use caves. I mean, even bears use caves, so not even just smaller animals, but so many animals use caves that it makes so much sense that, you know, dinosaurs would use caves too. So I really like that they've shown them using caves. Especially, you know, especially if they're dinosaurs that live in a colder area, it makes sense they would definitely want to use caves. And I really like the little fungus things that were up on the top of the cave, because I was really interested what they were at first, because I was like, are those some kind of bug? Because, you know, today when you think of animals on top of caves, you usually think of bats and bugs, but it was cool thinking of fungus that would use lights to catch bugs. Um, I don't know, maybe there's actual fungus that does that today, but I don't, I was not aware of that. And maybe that was one of their speculative things, but I actually really liked that. I thought that was a really cool feature. Uh, and then the Pachyrhinosaurs coming on, or I will say with the Pachyrhinosaurs coming on screen, I honestly realize we have not had many Ceratopsians or Ankylosaurs in this documentary, which is kind of weird considering, you know, that's the whole documentary is Lake Cretaceous, and these are two of the more popular Lake Cretaceous herbivores and common Cretaceous species, but... I'm not complaining too much because usually when they've showed herbivores in this documentary, it's been hadrosaurs, and I have really, really enjoyed the hadrosaurs in this documentary. And I also know we're getting Triceratops as one of the main dinosaurs in the next episode, so I'm fine with it personally. But I would, I might have liked to have seen a little bit more from the Ankylosaurs because I really did like the Antarctopelta in this documentary. Uh, um, and then once again, I want to say I love seeing the dinosaurs in the snow. The Pachyrhinosaurus looks super cool in the snow. And I love the look of the Packy. Um, I like the weird looking horn bump. And it almost reminds me of like a brain. And I like the quills on it, which I believe are kind of speculative. But considering Pacificosaurus had them, and it's an early Ceratopsian, I think that it's, there is a possibility that other Ceratopsians like Triceratops and Pachyrhinosaurus could have them. And I definitely don't think you're going too speculative if you throw quills on a Ceratopsian. Um, and I was really glad to see Nanoxaurus, a dinosaur I really like. Pretty much just a smaller likely feathered t-rex because uh, you know it's a tyrannosaur pretty closely related to t-rex that had that with how north it was there's a good chance it had feathers so what i'm using for nanoxaurus in this video is literally just the juvenile t-rex that spark lemon made a while ago that just has feathers pretty much you could pretty much just do that and make a nanoxaurus figure just make a t-rex figure put feathers on it and label it as nanoxaurus and you're pretty much good um so whoever is working for safari limited or collecta or Schlock or Papo or Pienso, if you're seeing this video, get on that Nanoxaurus because people are wanting that Nanoxaurus. And by people, I mean myself. <laughs> but I'm sure there's others that would like it as well. Uh, and I do really like that this is another example of a Tyrannosaur versus Ceratopsian. Because, you know, we know Triceratops and T-Rex and a bunch of others like the Splitosaurus and um, like Styracosaurus, that might not be the actual matchup. And you know, a lot of the time you think of either Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus, but Nanoxaurus also did go against Pachyrhinosaurus, so I like seeing that. Uh, and then the circle protecting the young reminds me a lot of muskox protecting the young from wolves, which I'm guessing had a lot of inspiration on this scene because that's what it reminded me of so much. Uh, and I was honestly surprised that the Nanoxaurus decided to take on the bull that, you know, got separated from the herd. Uh, oh, considering it looked like the herd was breaking up to the, um, uh, it looked like it was breaking up to the point where one of the young might get loose because they could have easily killed one of the baby ones. I think there was three baby ones. They could have easily killed one of them. But considering they took on one of the toughest ones and did it successfully was pretty cool. Uh, like, their fighting style reminded me a lot of dog packs, and by dog packs, I mean, like, wolves and African wild dogs, um, where they will distract from the front, and the others will, like, grab it from the back. It reminded me a lot of that, so that was really cool. I loved how much in this documentary I've seen current-day animals that do stuff very similar to the dinosaurs in this documentary, because if you watch a lot of documentaries or you're just outside a lot and observe animals a lot, you just see a bunch of this stuff actually happen, so it's cool to see that, uh, and then I do want to say this though. Um, I think Red Raptor Wrights mentioned that he actually liked it. And I do like this too, that they like show the dinosaurs as just like actual animals and we don't have a bunch of fighting. Uh, but personally, um, I, I mean, I do like seeing the dinosaurs in the documentary just acting like animals and not just fighting. And I do like the interspecies conflict or the interspecies fighting. But personally, I still do love a good predator versus prey fight or two different predators fighting each other like 
Um, say they did like Albertosaurus against Despletosaurus, that would have been really cool. But uh, something like that, I really like that still. Um, because, you know, we, we still get that in nature today. I don't think every dinosaur documentary should have it 24-7, but I do like when it's included. Um, like, because, you know, we get lions and hyenas fighting over kills, and we get wolves hunting elk. So it's cool to see that um, just in this documentary because that is one thing that I'll honestly say this documentary has kind of been lacking is actually the dinosaur fights. But I think it's fine because, you know, we get it so much in every other dinosaur documentary, but I still wanted to see prehistoric planets spin on um, dinosaurs fighting. So I was actually personally glad to see some dinosaurs fighting that weren't interspecies. Uh, just because, you know, we still get do get that today in the real world. Uh, Uh, and the MVP for me, there was three candidates, the Antarctica Pelta, um, I just really liked it, and they were super cute, and I just enjoyed watching them a lot. Uh, then I have a tie for the, but I will say the Antarctica Pelta, it just didn't have enough on screen time, or do enough on screen for me to actually award it MVP, but I did really like it. Uh, but the two that actually tied was Allura Titan, uh, this is actually not an Allura Titan figure, and I know that PNSO has one. And Collecta has one, so I'm going to try to get one of those. Um, because I really like the Allura Titan. Uh, I like how it behaved a lot. I like how it looked, and specifically how it parented. But the other member that tied for me for the MVP was actually Nanoxaurus. So, the fourth Tyrannosaur tying for MVP. Which is kind of crazy. Uh, but I am going to go back in my like final recap episode and actually give one MVP. So, any of the episodes I gave a tie to, I'm actually going to go back. And I will say... Considering that T-Rex is in more than one episode, I'm probably going to give Mosasaurus the MVP in the first episode because I was kind of leaning that way anyways, but considering that T-Rex appears in another episode, I'm probably going to lean Mosasaurus in the first episode. But I still do really like what happened in the T-Rex in the first episode because that's why I gave it a tie for MVP. But Nanoxaurus does tie for MVP in this episode. Um, and pretty much I've decided I really like what we've seen of the Nanoxaurus in the documentary, and I pretty much decided that... Um, if they were ended up being successful in killing one of the Pachy Rhinosaurus, I was probably going to give it MVP or tie for MVP. And considering that they successfully killed an adult bull male, I had to give it to them because it was just such a cool fight. And I was expecting them to either not make a kill or kill a baby one. So if they would have killed a baby one, I still would have probably gave them a tie for the MVP. But considering they took down a bull male Pachy Rhinosaurus, probably the toughest thing that they could kill where they live. I definitely had to give him a tie for MVP. Uh, some of the coolest Tyrannosaurs in the documentary. Some of the coolest Tyrannosaurs in general. Uh, I really like them. Uh, but one thing that I almost thought was going to happen for a second, whenever the Pachyrhinosaurs kind of turned for a second, I thought they were going to almost come back and try to protect it, almost like Cape Buffalo do for uh, uh, their herd members. So I thought that, that they were almost going to do that for a second, but they didn't end up doing that. So uh, kind of worked out for the Nanoxaurus. And, you know, Pachyrhinosaurus, I don't know how smart they were, but they probably weren't as smart as... Actually, I don't know. They might have been smarter than um, um, things like Cape Buffalo, but I don't know. Um, so, I, But they didn't end up coming back and helping it, so worked out great for the Nanoxaurus. Uh, so definitely had to give them the tie for MVP. Uh, because it was very impressive in them taking down a bull male, especially as easily as they did it. Uh, now I'm going to go over the figures in this video. Uh, I have this Edmontosaurus to represent just the hadrosaurs in the documentary. Then I have this, I think this is a Cychania. Uh, it is a baby or a small ankylosaur that Schlocked or Sledge made uh, for the baby Antarctica Pelta. And then I have this. What is it? Hippacrosaurus for the Allura Titan, just because, you know, it's kind of got the crest and the sail. Uh, and then I have this, uh, this. This is a Therizinosaurid. I don't remember which one it is, but uh, pretty much to represent the Ornithomimus, just because it's another herbivorous theropod or omnivorous theropod like Ornithomimus. I need to get more omnivorous theropods because I like them so much, especially Dinochirus. Uh, and just for these, like, videos, I just don't have a figure to represent them. Um, and then I have this, oh, this is from the Safari Limited, one of the feathered dinosaur tubes 
This is just a far limited standalone figure. This is from the Walking with Dinosaurs movie figure line. This is from Slyke's minifigure line. This is a Cynornithosaurus. Um, this is to represent the Dromaeosaur in the documentary. Um, and that's also in that Feathered Dinosaurs tube. So if you want to get both those figures, it's in the same tube. And then this Truodon from Walking with Dinosaurs is a minifigure that came in their minifigure set to represent the Truodontid. Um, and then this feathered T-Rex, or this juvenile T-Rex is to represent Nanoxaurus. And like I said, if you work for one of those companies, get on that Nanoxaurus. <laughs> um, and then this Pachyrhinosaurus is a Jurassic Park one. And I think this is actually made by the guy who's making Beast of the Mesozoic, or he contributed to the sculpt, so I really like it. Um, and I liked it before anyways, but considering that he worked on it, it looks a lot like something he would make, so. Uh, and once again, though, the documentary is still amazing. The last two videos I've made, I've been a little bit more critical, like this documentary, just the not naming species, and on the last documentary, just saying things I would have liked to add it. But still, I'm kind of just nitpicking because I really like this documentary, and I'm just trying to almost pick out some bad just to make it seem like it's not perfect, but it is still probably the best dinosaur documentary out. Uh, depending on how that last episode goes at least, but I'm planning for another great episode. Uh, so thank you all so much for watching. Stay tuned, and we will have that fifth episode and the conclusion episode for Prehistoric Planet.